You can't help but notice them when you fly into San Francisco. In fact, for years, I've been looking out the plane window wondering what in the world those brightly colored, oddly shaped pools of red water were down there in the bay. In fact, you even hear passengers debating what they think these pools are. It's been a real mystery. Well, finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to find out. So putting on my detective hat, doing some research, and finally actually visiting the mysterious site itself, I now have the answer. These pools aren't pools at all. They're ponds. And the weird red-colored water in these ponds is part of a huge farm, a farm that grows California's gold. The adventure started as I met up with Jill Singleton and John Piles, loaded up and quickly headed out into the fields. Actually, we were driving down narrow, bumpy strips of land going right out into the water. I didn't know what I was getting into. This has to be one of the most bizarre and beautiful places I've ever visited. And it turns out this strange yet wonderful farm had a rich history to it. Well, John, you know why I'm here, what we're in search of, and the question is, what the heck is this? Well, Hugh, welcome to California's salt fields. Salt fields? Yes, you're in the middle of the salt fields. After the gold rush started out here, there was nobody in California, and then all of a sudden there was lots of people in California and more coming all the time. They had to have salt. You, can't, you have to have salt to live. And they, people saw the Indians around here making, uh, gathering salt off the edges of the bay, and they copied it. So Captain Johnson up the road here started making salt, and uh, people saw that he was successful at that. And pretty soon, before you know it, there's about two dozen salt plants all around the edge of the bay. How do you make salt, and why did they make salt here instead of somewhere else? Well, you'll, basically, we take in salt, salty water from the San Francisco Bay. We put it in our ponds, let the sun and the wind evaporate the water, and what's left over is salt. So these are called salt ponds. Yes. And they're huge. How many of these things do you have? We've got over 80 salt ponds and they cover about 29,000 acres here in the South San Francisco Bay. Have we been making salt here in the San Francisco area the same way since the gold rush days? Basically the method's the same, uh, but the trick, and anybody can make salt. You put salty water in some kind of a pan and let it evaporate, you're gonna get salt. The trick is you gotta do a lot of little things right to be successful and have a successful business. Out like of it. what? You mean like marketing and that sort of thing, but That's the actual production of the salt is is pretty simple. Pretty simple, but you get you, you can make some mistakes and cost yourself quite a bit and, uh -huh. and lose money on the whole deal. Yeah, but the the reason it's here is you know we got a good combination of weather for evaporating the salt. You got to have flat land. You got to have some clay so that your product doesn't disappear out the the bottom of your ponds, and you got to be uh, in a good transportation situation with your customers. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So all of this came together 150 years ago here in this part of San Francisco Bay. That's right. That's where it started. Now, John, this is the way the salt ponds look today, and have looked for over a hundred years now, Jill. This is the way they would have looked, or at least a lot of this area would have looked, 150 years ago. That's true, Hugh. Well, uh, most of our salt ponds came from the marsh and the farmland that was here at the south end of the bay. So people used to farm out here? Well, they farmed more uh, this way, and this was the marshland, and some of our ponds were 
you know, our pond sort of bridged the two areas. And the marshland, and you know, back in the olden days, marshland was considered swamp land, very poor land. And the government, in fact, passed a law in the 1840s encouraging people to dike off the marshes, drain them, and farm them because they felt farmland was productive. Marshland grew mosquitoes, and <laughs> you know, I had bad smells associated with it and disease. So a lot of the lands around the Bay Area were create were uh, converted to farmlands, and and then some of them, uh, the farmers found that they could make even more money with salt. So then they turned some of their farmlands into salt lands. So there was kind lands. of an evolutionary process. Here. That's right. Yeah. All right. What if we walk down here right now? What's down here? Well, Is uh, there anything? Are we going to sink up to our knees in something? Or? I, I hope not. It's high tide and so it is going to be wet. Right. What's what's out here? This is all pickleweed and, and uh, there's a red marsh, red-bellied salt marsh harvest mouse that's an endangered species that lives out here. Well, don't step on any of them. Oh! <laughs> See, here we go. This is exactly... <laughs> See, so no wonder nobody wanted this land early on. <laughs> well, it's pretty tough to do much with it, but we, you know, we have to appreciate that marshland does have an environmental value. Of course, today it does, but back then, people didn't they didn't conceive, appreciate it. Didn't no. appreciate it. No, they didn't appreciate it. I think we do appreciate it now, and there are certainly a lot of people who would like to create more marshland, and we have actually contributed to that to some extent. We've turned some of our salt ponds back into uh, marsh in a few locations. Boy, this is absolutely beautiful out here. And this is this water that we're seeing out there is just coming in from the bay? Yeah, that's part of Maori Slough, and that's a, a, a river that comes into the San Francisco Bay. The fresh water? Pretty fresh. Yeah, it comes running off the mountains. Jill, I was commenting just how beautiful it is out here. Yeah, we think it's really gorgeous, too. I'm glad you appreciate it. I mean, it's a, it's a very strange, you know, unearthly-looking beauty, but it's very, very dramatic, and uh, you know, look how shiny it is, and the colors, and... You know, well, you see, this is kind of what you see when you're in the plane flying over, but when you get up to it close, it really has a beauty to it, and of course we couldn't have had a better day, but look at the way the sun is reflecting off the salt out there. Yeah, it, it's great, you know, and the color of the water, Hey, it, it's just beautiful. I mean, I um, I feel really privileged to be able to get out here and see this every once in a while, you know? Do the workers appreciate it, John? Well, they love it out here. A lot of them love to work outside, and what sparkles is gold to us. How deep is this? I don't know. I think this is... I mean, is if we a... jumped in here the way we did in that <laughs> marsh over there, <laughs> would we go up to you'd, our knees? Would sink we... up to about to your knees, yeah. And what's underneath the salt, is it like that all the way down? Well, it's just salt all the way down to the mud. Yeah, so underneath that is just mud. These are just muddy bottomed ponds. Right, San Francisco Bay mud. Just the natural soils here. That's what, but you know, that's what uh, is important to, because the natural soil is a clay, you know, it, it uh, holds the salt above it. it. The salt doesn't seep through, and we don't lose our salt because we have this thick clay mud, and that's one of the reasons we can make salt here in the San Francisco Bay. And you can't make it, I mean, it's not made anywhere else in California, is well, it? Well, there's one small salt company down in San Diego, but uh, other than that, th this is the only place in the United States where you can harvest salt from basically seawater. And one of the, there aren't very many places like this even in the entire world. So it's one of nature's gifts to the Bay Area, I think. And, uh, you know, it's salt is used. Uh, there's 14,000 uses for salt. It's used in just about everything you, you can imagine. Now she's starting her salt lecture. <laughs> you do this, don't you? I do this for a living. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now we don't have time to go into all 14,000, but the idea is even from the earliest days, Right. It was used. Well, back in the gold rush days, they would have just used it basically for table salt. Oh, no, no, no. You, they didn't have refrigeration back then, so salt was used. It's been used for 15,000 years to preserve food. Ah. 
and uh, you also they use it to tan leather so the basic things like that but we use it in just about every industry now but in agriculture uh, it's it's essential uh, it's essential to make pharmaceuticals uh, it's essential for food processing of course uh, water conditioning to keep the winter roads uh, open over the Sierras uh, and many many different products have their basis or at one stage or another they employ salt all right the salt lecture and <laughs> tour continues now is I'm noticing there's salt beginning to crystallize on the edges here. Sure, there's salt all underneath here. We're growing a crop of salt there right now. Really? Yep. Where is it? It's underneath the water. How far underneath the water? A couple feet. So it's, it's not really water. You know, this is really heavy, heavy brine. So this is not, this is not like water at all. It's very, it's much thicker than water. Water will float on top of this. This liquid's been in our system concentrating for five years, and it's dropping salt, but it's really a very uh, heavy mineral solution. Wait a minute, you said water would float on top of this? That's right. It when it rains. When it rains, the water stays right on top of that. If you were to go swimming in there, you'd float like a cork. Can I go down here and come down with oh, me? thank you. <laughs> I want to see what this feels like, at least. It's going to feel... I think it feels a little oily, doesn't it? It's certainly, it's certainly, uh... Well, it's not that thick. It's not that thick? Can I taste this? <laughs> sure. Oh, wait a minute. It does have kind of a... Yeah. It has kind of an oily... Yeah, it does, huh? It does have an oily sort of uh, feel to about, it. This is 20% uh, heavier than water. 20% heavier than water. And you will, if you see down here, there are a few brine shrimp that are left in the water at this uh, heavy salinity. You can see them. They don't reproduce anymore when it gets this salty, but look at the color they are. They're bright orange. Bright see? orange brine shrimp. Little teeny, little teeny <laughs> brine shrimp. That's what you'd feed your tropical fish at home. Yeah. Boy, how am I going to get this? It's beginning to beat up on my hands. <laughs> it makes salt right on your hands. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. It, it feels like oil on there. Yeah. Pretty soon you could wipe your hands like that over your steak tonight and you'll salt your steak. <laughs> okay, here is the field growing over here. Here comes your crop going off to market. And here is the crop being harvested right over here. Look at this. This is an honest to goodness salt field. Isn't it? Yes, it is. We've drained this pond now and we're harvesting it. Okay, so before you harvest, you drain all of that red water right. out of there. We drain the brine away now, so that we, we can walk, put the equipment out here. Can we, is it safe to walk yep. out here? Yep. Pretty safe, you <laughs> Boy, this is a weird feeling. Yeah. And look at the size of this salt field out here. Right, this is about a 400-acre pond. This is amazing salt as far as you can see. Now, how are we going to just go right down here? Well, we, should probably go, we should probably hurry up just a minute. I don't think he's going to wait for us. Oh, we're going to get over on this side? Whatever side you want. locomotives after employees that have been here a long time. Oh, really? So that was the Roger Silva locomotive. Now this is, can I grab a piece of salt? Sure. Here this it is, is. This is the salt that we've harvested, and it, this is before it's washed. And by the time we wash it and put it on the salt stack, this is going to be brilliant white. Now I keep wanting to taste everything. What's this going to taste like? It'd be pretty salty. <laughs> But I mean, it's it's healthy to no problem. Boy, it's hard. I mean, it's real hard. Oh yeah, it's real hard. If you fall down on this, you skin your knee pretty good. Now, what's happening out here? Well, what we're seeing here is our harvester. This is a mechanical 
a harvester that was invented by the salt company in the 20s and it's the reason why Leslie Salt Company actually put the other salt companies out of business because before this thing right here yeah before salt was harvested mechanically you had people out here with uh, picks and axes and and we had uh, uh, I don't know. Is it, I don't know how fast they harvested back then, John. But I'm sure it wasn't anything like what the machine could Boy, do. Look at this. This is beautiful. Yeah, historically they, we'd harvest with pick and shovel, and uh, the, we had trains back in those days. But the trains were pulled by mules, and. Uh, as Jill said, the reason that where the salt company is left after those two dozen was we run, won the race to invent the mechanical harvester. And look, here comes another one of your little trains pulling in. Right there, just on a circular track. They just keep going around and around. They pick up a load of salt, take it in, dump it, and come right back. Boy, there is so much to see when you're here. This has its own beauty to it as well just looking out here yeah they make pretty nice cuts huh but boy this doesn't <laughs> what is this well this is mud uh, what we have here is we have mud that's what's at the bottom of the salt and you know the whole trick with running the harvester is to pick up all the salt and leave all the mud yep. and uh, you know sometimes uh, you know, we misjudge and we get a little bit more mud we, <laughs> and then, than we want, but it does all wash off. Hey, Huel, you know, this, this track is temporary. We call it portable track. When the harvester goes by, we've got a crew that you can see in the background here that grabs a hold of this rail and moves it over the width of one harvester. So when the harvester gets down to the end of its cut, it just turns around and just keeps coming back the other way. So the track just keeps moving across the field. Just keeps hopscotching right across the salt line. Okay, now we're getting into some serious salt harvesting down here, aren't we? You bet. The harvester's putting out about 350 tons an hour of salt. Oh. You know, it's a pretty simple looking operation, really. The idea is just scraping the salt right off the surface. Right. The basic idea of the mechanical harvester hasn't changed since the 20s. The same basic equipment there, but what we've done is modernize it. We've got state-of-the-art hydraulic equipment, uh, TV cameras that help us control the cut. Uh, Boy, look at this salt coming out here. There's salt flying everywhere up here. <laughs> look at all this salt. We're getting most of it in the car, believe me. Wow. There it goes. And are these, what are these guys doing standing out here? Well, these guys are in charge of the railroad track. And all the time that we are moving this harvester and putting salt in the cars, we're also moving the track so that by the time this harvester gets to the end of one side of the pond, it can turn around and come straight back. We don't lose it at any time at all in filling the car. Would it take them to harvest all of this salt? How long would it take to harvest this field of salt? That's going to take about seven to eight weeks, 24 hours a day, rain or shine. Really? Yep. We just go back and forth like this until it's done. We'll take a couple of hundred thousand tons out of here. We're oh. harvesting. You know, we're harvesting here from just after Labor Day on most years until. this thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's jumping and pulling and there's salt everywhere. It's a great feeling. This yeah. is fun. <laughs> it's a privilege. <laughs> Huel, you know, a lot of people are interested in this salt business, but you know, there are some people who are train buffs and we have one of the few private railroads and this is uh, so what these guys are doing here is they're working on the track this is 24 inch gauge track and uh now wait a minute this is your own private i mean this isn't a registered railroad though well i mean it's on private property i don't know who we register it with but it is our railroad and you know it's pretty special the salt company designed 
the locomotives and built them and the cars and we maintain this track you know and so there are a lot of people who are just railroad buffs that come out here when we have our tour and you know once a year just to see the railroad to take pictures they call us up we're in railroad books and all kinds of things because we got over 20 miles of railroad track here but it's constantly moving this part of it is yeah <laughs> yeah that's true it's that's, it's pretty this tricky makes this railroad unique well it's probably the largest movable railroad in the northern california <laughs> okay this is an old place you're you bet we're rocking into the washer now it was built probably in the 20s and the trains come in here loaded and dump the salt and get into our wash system where we're cleaning off the mud that came from the ponds and then we put it on our stack. So here it is being washed right over here. You just basically are washing the salt off. Right, we use the brine that it was growing in and are washing the mud off the outside of the salt crystals. And that's all there is to it, just washing mud off pure salt. That's it, and then it goes onto the stack at about 99.6% salt. Okay, I've seen a lot of spectacular sights in my life, but we have finally gotten to one of the most spectacular I have ever seen. This is a stack of salt. Huel, this is a growing <laughs> stack of salt. We've been harvesting about two weeks. It's 90 feet tall and it's going to grow all the way back to the very end of the stacking ground here. We'll put 300,000 tons here and when we get done with that we're going to go over this other side and put 400,000 tons on that side. So all this, this is, high. This is just from the beginning just, of the harvest. This is just two weeks worth. This is the tip of the salt stack. This is just the beginning, yeah. The tip of the salt iceberg. Yeah, the tip of the salt now, iceberg. Now let me taste this because this is good old pure washed homegrown California salt right here. And people all over the world would die to get this quality of salt to eat. Yeah. Boy, it's good. Never thought I'd say that about just eating some salt. <laughs> you were telling me that this stack of salt is so big that what? Well, we get we see that a lot of student pilots come out here and they practice doing their turns around the salt stack. And it, it's a landmark for any pilot. You know, they're guided into the airports around the bay because this is the first thing you can see. It's so bright white, you can see it from a, quite a distance. When you're on the bridges down here in the South Bay, the San Mateo Bridge or the Dumbarton Bridge, you can see one of our salt stacks, either one in Redwood City or the one over here, depending on which bridge you're on. Now we've walked over to the other side because really from almost any angle, it's got a beauty to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I don't know if you can tell right now, but there's a little bit of pink cast to it, and that's from the, the color of the water that's still draining out of it. This is very fresh salt. But, you know, in the evening and at dawn, when if you're out here and the sky is very still and it's just right, you can, it just is really beautiful. It has a, a really beautiful character to it. Yeah. Well, this is absolutely spectacular to see this and realize that it is grown just like it has been. And you notice I use the word grown because it is a crop. Uh, it is grown here just basically like it has been since the gold rush days back in 1850 when those very early Californians realized that they had to have salt and figured out this was the way to grow it. It's been growing that way all that time and back before that since the dawn of humanity, grown wow. the same way. Thank you very much. Oh, it's been a real pleasure, Huel. We like, we're glad that you like it as much as we do. Well, now, I like it. It tastes good. But now, this kind of salt, the kind that we actually eat, table salt, makes up a very small part of what you all do, doesn't it? Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, this big uh, salt stack here will go to lots of different uses. Huel, 14,000 different uses, as a matter of fact. But only 3% of the salt we produce actually winds up in a salt shaker. And, and our brand here is the Leslie Salt brand because before Cargill Salt um, bought Leslie, Leslie brand was well known in the Bay Area in Northern California. And we still have kept that red Leslie label. And what's interesting is that you are continuing the tradition started by over 30 little salt companies that were scattered all along the bay here 
and are part of the history of our state. So when you look at, at this pile of salt, at first it may appear to be just a pile of salt, but in truth it is a big old pile, a big old stack of California's gold. That's it right there.